I think it's time to begin. All right. So, hi everyone. My name is Eugene. Uh, we welcome to the talk about uh, well about our new meta programming platform for Scala. And uh, before we begin, I'd like to say that uh, this is joint work uh, with uh, Dennis, uh, uh, who you might uh, probably know thanks to his work on quasi quotes. And well, yeah, let's let's see what we've done. All right. So meta programming. Uh, what's meta programming? If you ask Wikipedia, it says that uh, meta programming is about uh, writing programs that manipulate other programs in in any ways, generate them, analyze them do other fancy stuff. And uh, since it's uh, such a broad topic, uh, it's actually applicable to a lot of things that you might not even uh, realize that it's metaprogramming. So code generation, it's uh, kind of natural, right? Uh, but there's also other stuff like program verification, refactoring. I mean, even even SBT is essentially doing metaprogramming. That's kind of cool, and it's, uh, it sort of shows that this domain is, is important for us, for, uh, for things we do every day. All right, uh, so let's uh, let's put things into perspective and see how uh, metaprogramming in, is done in Scala. So before Scala 2.10, uh, uh, we could say that uh, we, we had the, some sort of an ad hoc approach to, to metaprogramming. Uh, namely, it, it was possible to inspect uh, metadata, me metadata, for instance, signatures of methods, uh, using text-based output from this ut uh, utility called Scala P. It was also possible to hook into the compiler pipeline using the compiler plugins uh, interface, but unfortunately that interface was unstable and uh, certainly undocumented. And finally, well, everyone could do code generation, which is arguably uh, the most popular use of metaprogramming, but it was just text. So you just throw together some strings, uh, put there some more strings, and well, here you go. All right, so what happened in Scala 2.10 is that we got this cool vehicle and uh, as technology freaks, we, I mean, we should appreciate that uh, it's, it's some sort of a machine, so, some sort of a principled approach. Say, with the Scala Reflect, uh, which became a part of uh, uh, Scala standard distribution in Scala 2.10, we got a full-fledged model of Scala, which included all native constructs of Scala, not just uh, Java, uh, which Scala compiles down to, but all intricacies like by name parameters, higher kind of types, and stuff. So everything is available in a neatly packaged, comprehensive, full-fledged model. That's, that's kind of cool. And the second part is that this model, it enabled the structured approach to Go generation. So thanks to macros and lately to quasi-codes, it's possible to do more than just throwing together some strings. And it's, it's interesting and it's empowering. It actually saves, times, uh, sa saves time when you need to do metaprogramming. But on the other hand, uh, Scala Reflect has a number of known issues. Well, first of all, since it was born uh, from our effort to expose uh, uh, co the compiler itself, like compiler plugins, but in a more controlled manner, uh, it's, it ended up being bound to Scala C internals. And as such, it's, it's kind of complicated. And uh, I guess uh, uh, some of you guys, uh, you've already written macros and compiler plugins, you know wh what I'm talking about. So some things are at times hard to understand. Uh, the second thing, and it's uh, sort of the natural consequence of the first one, is that uh, Scala Reflect ended up being quite brittle. So instead, the compiler compiler is a, is a complex beast, and uh, we have a number of uh, invariants that are sort of assumed uh, to be to be satisfied. And of course, as a compiler writer, you know this by heart, and you sort of understand that, and you never break them, or you do, and then uh, and then there are bugs in in Jira. But anyhow, if we expose this stuff to the users, then bad things happen definitely. And uh, yeah, we didn't like the result. We, we have to admit that. And finally, since um, uh, Scala Reflect is a sort of a natural extension of uh, Scala compiler itself, it's very much bound to Scala internals by definition. And therefore, if you want uh, to, to port uh, code that uses Scala Reflect to other platforms, for instance, to IntelliJ, then you're essentially out of luck because the surface of the API is so huge and the idi idioms are so bound to Scala C internals that it's quite hard to, to implement it right. Okay, uh, so nevertheless, I've been saying about all these shortcomings of Scala Reflect. I think it was a success uh, because it enabled the whole class of new libraries like uh, async, pickling, or blitz, and uh, it made existing solutions uh, like Scala test 
or parboiled, it, it made existing solutions better. And that's kind of cool. And the f finally, we, we got um, a, a range of libraries that started using macros and uh, the Reflect API in, in general to, to build uh, uh, more higher level principled abstractions over them. So that was kind of fun. And we see the Scala Reflect is useful. So what do we do? Well, we're building a better technology that will bring us beyond the light speed barrier. So, and we call this technology Scala Meta. It's supposed to be a successor for, uh, for Scala Reflect. And it's essentially everything that Scala Reflect is and even more in a more principled manner. At the moment, uh, uh, we got uh, just, just an alpha version, but it's enough to power a few demos that uh, we'll, we'll see later today. And the uh, public preview, it's coming this fall, so uh, you'll be able to, to see uh, by your own eyes uh, how good or bad uh, the upcoming technology is. So just, uh, uh, yeah, so without further ado, let's uh, proceed to the stuff that we have. So speaking of language model, uh, so every metaprogramming API starts with a model for the language. Say, if we want uh, to work with code, if we want uh, to represent programs as data, we need some way of doing that. And let's see uh, how, we, how we're doing that in Scala Reflect. Because, man, Scala Reflect is sort of the foundation for, for, for the compiler uh, that compiles Scala. And that's the first place we should look at. So, well, first of all, we need to represent code, well, code that we write. And for that, there's a usual solution. We have abstract syntax trees. And uh, since in Scala we have terms and types, so we also have definitions, it's quite natural that uh, we have subclasses of this, uh, of this thing called tree uh, that, that model these particular flavors of trees. And then, well, we need to model semantics of, uh, of the syntax. And for that, we have types uh, that represent well types. And we have symbols uh, that, that are created for, for, for all definitions that the programmer writes. OK, this is, this is getting a bit, a bit complicated, right? I'm, I'm starting feeling some tension. But that's not it, because we have a whole bunch of other stuff that's put there just for the good measure. And uh, I guess uh, uh, from, uh, from the inside of the compiler, of, uh, from the compiler writer's perspective, this all looks pretty natural. So every Every single, of, uh, every single concept from that list, it, it has its usage. But all together, uh, they can interact uh, in inconsistent ways. So let's see an example. Uh, say, uh, say we have a list, and this quasi-code that represents a list of 1, 2, and 3. So that's, that's a tree. OK, that's fine. And then if we type check this tree, uh, then we can get uh, to its type. So OK, it's also fine. There are trees and types. So far, pretty good. And then we discover that we also have trees that represent types. Maybe you remember they're called tip trees. So OK. Then you might probably ask, so how, how is this u.type and universe.tree that represents the same type, how do they work with each other? Well, they don't. If you compare them, these are two different entities. And uh, this is quite a popular question, actually, on Stack Overflow. So what you actually need to do uh, to reconcile them is you need to type check this type tree using a type mode and get a type from it. That's quite natural, right? <laughs> so just to sum it up, uh, all these concepts that they've shown before uh, here, uh, they make sense. And uh, I'm, I'm really sure that they were introduced for, for, for good reasons uh, when the compiler was written. But on the other hand, a lot of concepts, they might spawn unexpe unexpected complexity. So in order to uh, address that in uh, Scala Meta, uh, here's what we did. So sure, we need to, to model syntax. We cannot get away from that. We need to represent programs that we write. And uh, well, this is it. We actually don't have anything else. We don't have types. We don't have symbols. And every reflection artifact uh, that we want to model is modeled with just its syntax. So types, members, names, even modifiers and flags, they're all represented as trees. And since there's only one way to do it, it's, it's actually quite neat. So let's see, let's see a couple examples. Well, uh, now, now we're looking at, at printouts uh, from uh, Scala Meta. So we, we also have quasi-codes. Well, quasi-codes, they're so useful that it would, be, it would be a pity to throw them away. So with quasi-codes, as usual, you can represent terms. And you can ask 
four types of those terms, and that's again quite natural. But what are types? Well, types, types are actually trees. So if you try to get to this list of int thing that we had a problem with before uh, using another flavor of quasi-codes, then you get exactly the same uh, then you get exactly the same thing as, as you get from .tp on this queue of list. And uh, it's quite natural that we want to do certain operation on, uh, operations on, on types. Uh, for instance, to ask for supertypes or subtypes, or to check uh, subtype in relation. And all that, these are just methods on a class called type. That's quite, quite simple so far. So what happens to symbols? So symbols, symbols represent definitions and uh, uh, how other uh, elements of programs can re refer to those definitions. Well, since they're definitions, let's model them as definitions as their syntax. So here we uh, see two ways of obtaining symbols it's, um, now th that are characteristic to scala reflect. First, you can take a type and you can in inspect its members. And these members, they will be symbols in scala reflect. But in our model, they're just trees, trees for definitions. And secondly, you can take a reference and uh, you can uh, resolve this reference. That also gives a definition. And of course, there's only one way of doing that. Uh, so whatever path you take, you actually end up with the same thing. And again, for those who are uh, a bit more familiar with uh, Scala Reflect, uh, we support all the natural things that you expect from symbols. Say you, you can figure out, if you have a method, you can figure out which class is defined in. and uh, you can you can also uh, you can also take a look at the signature uh, of a given method because well this method is represented as its syntax and its syntax it includes all the information about parameters return types and so on and so forth so the the last printout it illustrates that so if we if we take a look at this head that we just got it's it's just a normal definition just as if you've written the syntax yourself in a Scala program all right uh, so some of you might be thinking, too simple, this, this cannot work. Why wasn't it done like that in the first place, right? So if you have list and list of one, two, three, so how do you figure out that this list is scala.list but not scala collection mutable list, huh? Well, so how it's done in scala reflect? And this is some sort of a tunnel vision that Plague does before. So, with scala reflect, there are actually two ways of representing this list in list of one to three. So first, you can do only trees, okay? So you take this quasi code, uh, list one to three, and then you put it in a bigger context where you purposefully hijacked this name list. And if you try to type check the result, uh, the toolbox will say that int doesn't take parameters, which is its way of saying that, oh my God, I messed up the bindings. So what do we do? And well, in Scala Reflect, there's only one way we use symbols for that. So first you get a symbol that is some entity that represents this particular list you're interested in. In this case, Scala Collection Immutable List. I, I've shortened up the name so that it fits into the slide. And then you unquote the symbol into, into the resulting tree so that it's not only trees anymore, but trees with some symbols. And then if you put it into, into that context, it will all type check fine. So that's, that's the kind of complications that uh, we would like to avoid. But how do we do that? And I think that was one of the reasons why Scala C is not built on this uh, pure tree model. So how, how do we do that? Well, actually, as, as it happens in a lot of situations, there's a good paper about that. And that paper is quite ancient, actually. So it's from 1986, almost, uh, well, more than 25 years, right? almost 30 years. And uh, in that paper, uh, the authors, they talk about uh, the concept of hygiene uh, as, as applied to, to macro expansion. But in fact, it's, it's more generic. So what, what it talks about is um, how names like list uh, can track lexical contexts where they're declared. Say, if you write Q of list one to three, and in that lexical context, you have an import, import scala.list, uh, which is always there implicitly. Then this list, uh, this name, it's not going to be just a simple string. It's going to remember that import, and it's going to keep it in mind later. So that's, that's the beauty of this thing, that it can be implemented in an efficient fashion, and it actually has quite a neat calculus about it. So very, very, very interesting thing. And that's the missing technology that actually enables this. 
So here at the top part of the slide, we see uh, the example that was failing before in Scala Reflect. But in Scala Meta, we can, just, uh, we can write just that. And thanks to this hygiene, this uh, magic thing, uh, it will get things right uh, from the very beginning. So that's, that's a nice illustration how uh, a really cool paper can be applied to make, li uh, to make our lives simpler. And that's, that's cool. Thanks. So the second part. As we figured out, everything is a tree. And trees are enough to model everything. So let's, let's see how, how the trees are designed themselves. Well, first of all, um, so some of you who have had some experience of working with Scala Reflect uh, know that uh, certain trees, cer certain language constructs, uh, they're desugared right off the bat. But some, some of them are desugared by the parser, like for loops. So as you can see here, if you write a quasi quote which says for something, it will be desugared. And uh, some of them, they get desugared by typer. So that's not good, because uh, we want to make our trees as nice as possible, and they should be as faithful as possible as a model of language. And therefore, in our trees, we model essentially every part of the language uh, with, the separate, uh, with a separate tree flavor. So here we, we get it. Uh, we, we don't lose any information. And actually, we, we have plans to, to preserve other metadata that, uh, that you might find interesting about your programs, uh, say, Scala docs, or formatting details, such as white spaces and comments. So that, uh, so that we can do faithful uh, pre uh, pretty printing. And that's, uh, that's just an instance of, of a bigger design goal. We want to not to lose any metadata at all. And we want to make it available for, for your meta programs so that you can have perfect fidelity. And that's, that's essential if we want to, to do robust meta programming. All right, so the next part is that trees are now typed. So it, it can come up as a surprise because Scala is a well, Scala values types. But in Scala compiler, trees are sort of dynamically typed. Well, in a sense. So as we can see, the apply AST node, which uh, models function applications, it actually takes trees as its arguments. So in effect, uh, you can construct an apply node that takes a type and applies itself to, I don't know, to a term, something that doesn't make sense in Scala at all. So and uh, the, the, these are the errors um, that are also frequently encounter, en encountered by people, especially since with quasi-codes, it's so much easier to construct trees, and there's higher probability that someone will stumble upon them. So in order to, to address uh, these issues, in, in our model, uh, trees are actually strongly typed. And since we have comprehensive trees that don't do any desugaring, we can actually classify them mi uh, meaningfully. So we can say that our applications, they take functions which are terms, that is, they cannot take types in principle. So it's, uh, we can say it's safe by construction because it's impossible to construct invalid trees. That's quite interesting. So let's, let's see an example, something that they promised before. So say we want to construct this uh, list of one, two, three again. And uh, we're doing this in two steps now. So instead of writing one big quasi-code, uh, we split it into two parts. So the first quasi-code will take a type, and then it will insert it into the invocation of well, and then it will insert it into another quasi code. So if you try to type check this, you'll get a super misleading error that scala.list is not a value. Well, of course it's a value. Come on. And what this thing doesn't say is that this TQ, it accidentally created a type instead of a term. And this scala.list, it doesn't refer to a companion object, but it refers to an actual class, this, this abstract class called list, which has two subtypes, colon, colon, and nil. And therefore, it cannot type check. But yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to understand these things when they go wrong. That's one of the instances uh, of the thing that I said, that there's some invariance preconditions in the compiler that we sort of learn as, as compiler developers, that we learned to, uh, to respect. But that's, that's just a habit, and it's, it's easy to, uh, to trip. OK, so. Speaking of Scala Meta, let's, uh, let's see an illustration of what we've seen. Since uh, the apply node, which is used to represent this list of one to three, is strongly typed, we can catch this kind of errors e easily and early. So we will just ha have a compilation error that says expected a type and got a term, which is quite reasonable, quite helpful. All right. Another, uh, another good aspect about Scala Reflect 
is that it makes heavy use of mutable state. And uh, you know, trees, they have uh, mutable fields, uh, like TPE. So here's, here's an excerpt from real code in Scala Reflect. So the type of a tree is actually stored there as a mutable var. And it's, a, it's, it's not just some implementation detail that, that's not, uh, that cannot be observed from the outside. No, trees, they actually proudly expose this mutable state via this TPE, and they also have a setter, even worse. So in essence, while you're operating on a tree, someone can mutate it while, you, while you're doing that. And of course, this is not that safe, this is not robust, and this is, this is not good. So what we've done in Scala Meta instead is that we're observationally immutable, and uh, things uh, like attributes, uh, which are typically modeled as uh, mutable fields, uh, they get uh, they get redirected to hosts, uh, that is to implementers of our API. So trees stay immutable, and hosts uh, they uh, they must implement this method in the mutable way, so that this this uh, so that people who use TPE they can uh, well they can use it reliably. All right, so this is it about the design of our trees, and let's see what. Uh, what this approach to, to metaprogramming enables. And uh, quite soon we'll see what, what they have in mind uh, uh, by saying this title. So, uh, there are some different uh, flavors of metaprogramming. This is, uh, this is another conventional knowledge that uh, seems to be so natural, but actually is not very well grounded. So as we know, there's compile time metaprogramming, which, is when, uh, wh which happens when you manipulate programs during compilation. And that's what macros are for. There's also runtime metaprogramming. You know, a, tr a runtime is a completely different environment. Therefore, it's kind of natural to expect that we'll have different set of APIs and different usages. So here we have Java-like runtime reflection. Here we have toolboxes that can compile code and launch it at runtime. And also we have what can be called sometime metaprogramming because it doesn't really fit any of these usages. So when, when SBT is doing its incremental compilation and analysis, what's that? Is it compile time metaprogramming or runtime metaprogramming? Or maybe, you know, we, we shouldn't even bother about this distinction, right? Because it, it only brings com complications. And complications, they don't add, end here, since we have various environments that provide metaprogramming APIs for the users. Say Scala compiler, the canonical example, the one that exposes Scala reflect the jar. Okay, that's one thing. There's another thing, IntelliJ. So in IntelliJ, they have a completely different type checker and completely different architecture of the type checker, which is, which is uh, well, in incompatible with Scala Reflect. We also have Scala ID, which is, uh, well, the same Scala compiler, but it, it acts weirdly sometimes, and we have to account for that. And the list goes on. So what, what's, what's, uh, what are the consequences? And consequences, they're not really dire, so we, we, can, we can live with that, but they create, um, they create inconsistencies, annoying ones. So uh, those of you who have used the toolboxes, you probably know that type check in toolboxes, that is at runtime, it behaves a bit differently from type check in macro contexts, that is at compile time. So the reason for that is really deep in implementation details of those toolboxes. But that's one of those small discrepancies that are quite painful. And they definitely prevent robust metaprogramming. OK, and then speaking of macros, we know that macros work at compile time, but how do, they ex how, do we make them, um, how do we make them work in the same file, in the same project? Well, we cannot, because, well, that's, that's, another, that's another inconvenience. And finally, uh, speaking of IntelliJ, since we mentioned it, well, macros seem to work in IntelliJ, because macros look like normal methods. But when they don't, then they don't work. So that's, that's unfortunate. And that's one of the things that, that we plan to address in Scala Meta. And actually, right now I have a demo that shows some of our progress. OK. So uh, let's, go to, let's go to IntelliJ and, uh, and try to code up a simple macro. All right. Okay, it's good. I think the font is okay, right? Okay, so what uh, what we'll be doing is writing this uh, interesting macro called join that uh, takes two values and then creates a sort of a proxy uh, that has all the vals uh, from the first value and from the second one. 
So here, as a result, what we would like to have is something like new val x first argument dot x and then val y equals second argument dot y. So don't don't seek uh, like big. Uh, I, I mean, th this this is just a toy example. So probably it's not very useful in practice, but it's quite useful to illustrate uh, how we write macros. All right, so we want to produce this code. And then, what's, what's our usual approach? We write a macro def, which looks like just like a normal function, and then we say macro, and then we go somewhere else, I don't know, and say def impo, that takes a context. Well, you know, this is what, what you would have done with Scala Reflect. And then say it takes a tree, blah, 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 do some stuff. And then you realize, oh my god, I need to put this, uh, this macro implementation into a separate project, because otherwise it wouldn't work. Well, imagine if we could just open braces here and start typing, right? And uh, that's, that's exactly what uh, we're implementing, and that's exactly what, what, what I'll be happy to show now. So inside these braces, uh, we can write exactly the same code as we could in, in the macro impl. So what, say, say quasi codes. Let's write a quasi code that will serve as a template for our macro expansion. And since, uh, since it's red, it says that they haven't imported something. So let's go ahead and import our namespace that provides quasi codes. Here we go. So what we want to do is to create a temporary variable uh, for x. Insert x here. Just uh, just normal techniques that uh, you might have become accustomed uh, if you played with macros. And then we want to create, I don't know, fields, Let's say proxies. So now we just have to, to generate these fields to fill them in. All right. So to do that, we need uh, some semantic APIs because we need to inspect uh, the list of members uh, that we have on, on the arguments. Okay, here we go, semantic, and here we also specify our handling strategy. Exceptions. Okay. All right, now we're all set. So what we can write here is, um, is a function that takes a type, so it just says meta.type. Uh, then it takes the name of a variable, like temp x, which is again a name, and returns uh, the list of vowels. So list of vowels. Those of you who, who have used macros before, you know what, what a hassle this is. So with the Scala Reflect, you would have to do members, and then you would have to say collect those th that are term symbols and blah, blah, blah. But why, why do this in a, such a complicated way when you can just say tp.vowels? <laughs> I know this is a long overdue, and I'm so happy that you appreciate it. <laughs> so, good. So what we do now is that we have this val, and we generate another one, which has exactly the same name. So as I mentioned before, this is very similar to the previous API. So the best parts of it, uh, we're, we're happy to take. Because quasi quotes they're so convenient, so great. Thank you, Dennis. That, yeah, we can just get, get rid of them. And then we take this name. And uh, and we dereference this field. All right, so we're almost all set. Now we just have to invoke this function. Val proxies equals mk proxy for the first type. Create a quasi code for that, and do the same for the second one. Okay, let's see whether there's gonna work. Let's compile. What do, what do you mean a custom SDK? Oh, th this, this uh, of course, because th this is a non-standard non macro, we need uh, something custom to expand it. And uh, currently, uh, we, we have a macro plugin which uses the hooks that I've put in place before the release of Scala 2.11. 
conveniently. <laughs> so th this this can actually work. Okay, let's hope that this time it will all be fine. All right, so we have our expansion, uh, but something's not quite right. And yeah, sure. Uh, the problem is that our macro returns any, and this result it also expects any. So we need to somehow signify that this is a white box macro. And we do this with the marker method. Since uh, by merging macro defs and macro impulse, we actually lost a syntactic way to indicate the flavor of the macro. Uh, well, C is uh, sort of reminiscent of, of the previous uh, context API. So actually, it could be just uh, white box. So don't don't mind the the exact wording here, uh, just uh, just the concepts. So since since it's just alpha software and public preview will come this fall, we will have enough time to to polish the names. So just for the sake of the demo. All right. So I guess now when we run it, we will get the expected result, two and three, and uh, amazingly enough, this all worked uh, in the same file. So I had I had to hard code this, but just a little bit. But uh, the, the best part, uh, the demo is not yet over, and the best part is, uh, is here. So what if we press this small icon? Then, wow, we are going to get this expansion in, in a separate tab. <laughs> and uh, as you might have expected, if you just change it here and save, you get the expansion here. Okay, so uh, so that you don't think that uh, uh, this only works in IntelliJ, let me show you something in Eclipse. That's going to be real quick. We're not going to, to call this up again and again. That's for sure. But, okay, almost there. And actually, the UI of Eclipse is, is a bit different. And uh, you'll see how. So there are pros and cons of both approaches. And it will be nice to... Uh, to know your feedback, what would work best for you. So here we have almost the same macro written a bit differently this night. Okay, so uh, here's, here's the same interface, uh, the, the gutter icon, and if you hover, you can see the expansion. Not very useful because if you press this thing, you can get it expanded in place. So that's, uh, that's the other approach that I was talking about. And uh, sure, it, it provides really nice experience in the sense that it doesn't create additional panels or UI elements, but also experimenting with it, it's it's a bit more difficult because you have to collapse it and to expand it again. Well, naturally, this this works. Okay, I guess uh, this is it for the demo. So as you can see, we take ID integration very seriously, and I'm so happy that we've managed to to show you something like that. And uh, let's proceed with the explanation. So now you might be thinking, so oh my god, how, how exactly is this supposed to work? Because you know, as, as we uh, told happily before, macros are just normal functions that are compiled down as normal Scala functions to bytecode, and then we just invoke them as bytecode using, well, Java reflection, you know, th this, this kind of stuff. And therefore, macros have to be pre-compiled, and Therefore, when you're in the same file, macros are not pre-compiled, they're being compiled at the moment, so what's going on? This, this of course, requires an explanation. So, the short story. Well, with uh, Scala.meta, as you've seen, we have really principled tools for metaprogramming. So we've, we've spent a lot of time designing this tree-only API, and uh, we've come up with something that's quite lightweight, and uh, that can be reasonably implemented by, well, a lot of interested parties. And therefore, macros can finally become a principled mechanism. So, you know, if all that you have is just some bytecode, it's really hard to reason about it, really hard to figure out what, 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 what it is uh, and, and to run it in different environments. So therefore, we've been able to, to turn, uh, thanks to the existence of Scala Meta, we've been able to turn macros into proper abstraction. And things get better from, from now on. Now, for a long explanation. Well, first of all, uh, we've uh, clearly defined the requirements for the implementers of our Scala Meta API. So Scala Meta, uh, learning from, from mistakes of the past, aims to be 
a standalone and independent metaprogramming interface. By that I mean that now it lives in a different repo, uh, not, not in github.com slash Scala, well, slash Scala meta naturally. And uh, it's, it, it doesn't plan to be well affiliated with a particular implementer. So it's just, it's just a clean model, a clean metaprogramming model that has interfaces that are quite easy to implement. So from what I remember, at the moment we have, what, 25 methods that we require from hosts to, to fill in. So that's the first part. Okay, we, we've settled down on the API. And that's essentially our goal, to, to become a standard for, for metaprogramming that everyone could converge onto. The second part is giving equal opportunities for all environments. Uh, by saying that, I mean, uh, you know, at compile time, it's, it's naturally to assume that at compile time you have more information about the program. You have these abstract syntax trees, whereas at runtime you only have Java bytecodes. But, well, as I mentioned before, we don't throw away metadata. So we actually save ASTs during compilation so that they can be used later. So that at runtime, you can type check, you can expand macros uh, to your heart's content with the same success as if you did that at compile time. And this, this can sound pretty crazy. Oh my God, saving additional stuff, you know, a lot of information. But actually, thanks uh, to the research of uh, my students at APFL, we figured out that the overhead, uh, the, the overhead might be really reasonable. So if we take scala library.jar, then compressed ASTs, well, albeit without types, but still all, all the information, they, they take only 15% of, of the, of the bytecodes, which is quite reasonable. So imagine we had types, we, we, we end up at 30 or even 40%, still okay. So that's the second part. So first we have a clear interface for hosts, and second we have all the required information. We don't throw away anything. And that enables, enables Brave New World, essentially. So once you, once you have ASTs, and once you have an API that the, that the programs represented in these ASTs use, you can interpret them. And that's exactly how, how we expand macros. So macro, uh, macro code is saved as ASTs, and then we interpret them anywhere uh, be it Scala C or IntelliJ or whoever else wants to implement our host API. So that's uh, that's uh, that was the the big idea that uh, sort of initiated the project. Yep. Okay, yeah, that, that's a good question. So the question is, uh, since we save ASTs, does it mean that, that we start caring about external tools, you know, that, uh, so that they don't have to reverse engineer what Scala compiler did to the code? Well, essentially that's the idea, not, not to lose anything and then see what can be done with that. So we, we're really happy to, to expose this. Yep. Okay, so the question was, uh, so currently there's um, an X uh, flag of uh, Scala C that, that can show expand the sugarings of four comprehensions, for instance. So could we do something like this with the Scala meta? Well, yeah, for sure. Since we don't lose information, it's, it's really easy to lose it when we want to, I mean, to the sugar stuff. But it's, it's really hard to, to go the other way. And, well, Dennis can attest to that. Y you can chat with him how he implemented quasi-quotes and unquoting for four loops. That was fun. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, the, the thing with interpretation of macros. That was just one of the examples of what becomes possible in, in the new scheme of things. And uh, let me show you another one. So that's, um, uh, that's just a mock-up, but it, it really conveys the idea. So, all right. <laughs> oh, man. What does it do here? Anyway, speaking of that example, um, if you've been to Simon Oxen Writer's talk, he mentioned that th there are plans to deprecate procedure syntax in Scala. And in fact, it's already deprecated, but this deprecation is hidden beyond uh, X future because so many people actually use this syntax, sometimes inadvertently, that if we impose this warning on all of them, that, that would be really bad. So what we need here is some sort of a code rewriting tool that would take existing programs and then rewrite procedure syntax to normal syntax, like 
I don't know, adding colon unit equals something. How 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 uh, how hard can it be? Well, apparently it can be hard when when you don't have principal tools for pretty printing, and that's that's the situation at the moment. So since uh, since Scala C it throws away all comments and details of formatting, the best that you can have uh, with the current API is just a program with uh, all the formatting lost essentially. Uh, all the formatting transformed to the to some sort of a lowest common denominator, and uh, that's not good. But on the other hand, if we don't throw out this information, which is what we do in Scala Meta, we can do interesting things. Imagine, uh, I was talking about hosts, that is environments that implement the API required from uh, required by Scala Meta, and one of these hosts is Scala compiler. Another one, as I alluded to, is IntelliJ, but no one prevents us. Uh, to implement other hosts. Take SBT. SBT knows a lot about programs, and we can turn this knowledge into something useful to us. So say we, we write a, a special com command for SBT, which launches a console that exposes the abstraction of a project, which is a list of files that, that constitute a project. This is quite a valuable inform information, sometimes non-trivial one, so why throw it away? Let's expose it. Expose it. And then, once, once we have uh, these files, uh, we can surely parse them, and we can present them to the user to do stuff that they want. And then you could say project.rewrite, case, quasi-code that features procedure syntax, arrow, quasi-code that features the rewritten syntax. And then you just call persist. So that's, that's how simple this should be, and I see no reason why it cannot. And... Uh, one of the questions that you might have, so this uh, colon unit, uh, how, how do you know that unit actually binds to scala.unit, not, not to some unit in scope? Well, that's, that's the hygiene thing that I was mentioning before. So with this secret sauce uh, derived from that wonderful paper, we can actually ensure that that unit will refer to the correct unit every time. And as I mentioned before, since we don't plan to throw away formatting, then it will be preserved here because we just reused the same trees that we matched before. All right, so that's uh, almost it. And now to, to wrap up, I'd like to thank people who contributed to, to the Palladium project, uh, those who, who made that possible. Uh, th thanks a lot, guys. Th that, was, that was really awesome. And uh, well, uh, just, uh, just to sum it up what we've heard today, uh, Scala Meta is uh, the new foundation, principled foundation for meta programming in Scala, uh, in which everything is represented with a tree. Uh, this brings uh, quite a, re a refreshing simplicity into the mix, especially given uh, the fact that uh, trees are strongly typed and really immutable. And that uh, turns Scala Meta into a clean and portable meta programming toolkit. And we're really lo looking forward into seeing how things can pan out given the new possibilities it provides. And uh, hopefully this fall, we will be able to actually fly at, <laughs> at this really fast speeds with this really nice tech. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> right. I guess we have some time for questions. Yep, please go ahead. Okay, I see. So e even previously, uh, you could write macros that expand into other macros, or macros that use uh, themselves. Um, well, those you probably couldn't write. And y y yeah, sure. So so this interpretation thing it means that macros can expand the anywhere, uh, including uh, the circumstances that you meant. Please. Uh, so the question was, uh, when uh, does the macro expansion happen? Well, currently in, in Scala C, macro expansion happens uh, during type checking. So as your programs are type checked, uh, references to, to macros, they're detected and then expanded. In principle, this scheme, uh, it worked more or less well for us. So it's, it's, it's reasonable to keep it to a degree, but just uh, whenever possible, we would like to to move macro expansions after type checking, after the entire program is type checked, after everything has stabilized, completed, these are some internal details, 
So essentially, we want to be we want this to be as robust as possible. Therefore, we want to expand macros, preferably after typer. But that's just an idea, and we need to see how it's going to work. Yes, that's that's correct, and that's why I'm saying that's just an idea. We'll have to figure out how to reconcile this. Okay, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so the question was about uh, mi migration. How do we migrate from old macros to new macros? What do we do about that? Well, since the API differences are indeed massive, uh, I don't have a clear answer for that yet. Well, it's it's really interesting for us to, to be able to port as much things as possible, uh, but we will we will have to see because currently the 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 API that I've shown the the glimpse of it well this dot vials method and you know see that white box uh they're they're not not set in stone so we will have to to think about that and then s speaking of uh, speaking of the migration path between uh, Scala to eleven and to ten even though in to eleven we've changed uh, some of the apis we've provided the compatibility import like import compat dot underscore like c dot compat dot underscore that took care of most of that stuff. So I'm hoping that similar technique could actually aid these problems as well. But that's re that remains to be seen. Yeah. So please go ahead again. OK, uh, the question is uh, how to participate. Um, uh, probably the best way would be to contact us. So. You, you can uh, you can Google up my Twitter account, for instance, and write to me or to Dennis. You know, that would be the best way right now, because as I mentioned before, this is a this is sort of alpha software, so no technology preview is available yet. So we don't have docs, for instance. Well, we have, but not not much. So the best thing would be to contact us directly, and then we'll figure this out. Yep, please. Okay, so the question was, uh, uh, interpretation is going to bring uh, some performance overhead. So what do we do about this? Is, is interpretation required or not? So that's, again, an open question, but we definitely consider an option to allow separate compilation. I mean, so if we already comp uh, have compiled something down to bytecode, why not allow executing it? And why wa waste CPU cycles? Okay, so there was a question from here. Okay, uh, so the question is that, um, as I said, the uh, the preview is supposed to to be released this fall, and what's what's the scope of it? What what what's planned to be there? So as I mentioned before, uh, the Scala meta effort, it's sort of, well, multi-part. Uh, the the first part is the API, which we sort of fleshed out to to, to some degree that we can implement something against it. And the second effort is actually implementation of hosts. That is, these connectors, adapters, if you will, that adapt, say, architecture of Scala C to, to what's required by Palladium. And uh, definitely hosts for Scala C uh, are, are in scope of that uh, technology preview. Also, integration with uh, IntelliJ, this is something that we work uh, together on with IntelliJ guys, and that's, that's what's interesting for us as well. Uh, we have some some other more crazy ideas, but that's probably for future releases. Yep, go ahead, please.
Okay. Uh, so the question was, given that we already have uh, some sort of a metaprogramming API, say that an, the one that enables macros, and now we have another API that's supposedly better, uh, wh what happens to, to the old one? So there were indeed plans to, to make macros standard part of Scala, at least, well, a subset of macros. So what happens to these plans? Uh, well, the, the question of uh, the future of uh, Scala Meta and Scala Reflect, it's it's a really tough one. Since we we don't have anything really concrete to, to show uh, so that we can uh, discuss this stuff with uh, TypeSafe, uh, it's, it's hard to say definitely right now. So maybe let's uh, revisit that a bit later. All right, please. All right, uh, the question was about debugger support. Yeah, I saw that coming because, I mean, I, I showed interactive expansion, but what about debugging? Yes, that's uh, that's uh, definitely on the table. Uh, just uh, didn't have time to, to implement that yet. <laughs> um, so th there was a question, how can we speed up development of such a debugger? Um, well, I guess if if you could uh, contact us, uh, we will figure out the details. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, a desert island sounds nice, as long as uh, there's no internet there, no satellites. Okay, please. Okay, that's that's a good question. Uh, th this is one of the parts um, uh, that are a bit, well, unstable, to say the least, uh, at the moment. So uh, uh, thanks to involvement of uh, the guys from, from IntelliJ, uh, uh, we've been developing the interpreter on their side against the, the old uh, Scala Reflect trees. And uh, indeed, there were concerns that uh, Scala is, well, uh, has uh, some surface. Uh, to say so, and it, it wouldn't be possible to 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 emulate to implement all of that in an interpreter. Uh, but you know what we ended up with was uh, something working for a lot of tests and something working in well in quite a plausible fashion. So now we're looking into porting this interpreter on the new trees since uh, the trees are now ready, and I think it's reasonable to say that it's going to work. But again, this uh, this remains to be seen this fall. All right, so I guess there's no more questions. Okay, the last one. Okay, so the question was, there's often a need when writing macros uh, to look into uh, bodies of other methods. So you're writing a macro that wants to optimize something, and it would be really nice to, to take a peek into some method that's used in your block in order to be able to inline it. And so the question was, uh, if we persist ASCs, can we deal with that? Yes, absolutely, that's, that's one of the goals. Yeah. Oh, another question. So let me check how we're on time. Yep, we have just one minute. Okay, uh, the question was, uh, since the trees are now immutable, uh, does this bring an end to reset the letters and untape check, whatever it's called in, in your Scala version? Yes, that's, that's a very big annoyance that we plan on fixing, and immutable trees, that's the first step towards it. So we'll obviously need to, to apply fixes to Scala compiler as well, to the host part of it, to this adapter, but yes, that will be fixed. Okay, I guess we'll wrap up. Thanks a lot for being here.